turn, turn it off and so on. Okay, should I continue? Okay, there. So if you'll play the music, that'll be great. Okay. And you could start that as soon as you do the introduction, whenever you want. Welcome everybody, we'll be starting in just a moment. Welcome everybody on behalf of Holocaust Museum LA. My name is Michael Morgenstern and I am an educator at the museum. This afternoon, you have the honor and privilege of listening to Henry Slucky, a Holocaust survivor from France who will share his story with you. And afterwards, you'll have the opportunity to ask him questions. Before we begin, I would like to share a few words about the museum. Our museum was founded in the early 1960s by a group of Holocaust survivors who wanted to make sure that the future generations would always remember what happened and have a place to study it and to learn about it. In the early 1960s, most survivors were not yet ready to face their tragic history, as a matter of fact, the community by and large was not yet ready to face this history. But thanks to the courage and foresight of this small group of survivors who built our museum, we have the first and oldest Holocaust survivor founded museum in the United States. Henry Slucky has been speaking at our museum for several years and sharing his story to help us fulfill our mission to commemorate, educate, and inspire future generations. Henry, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. And we are going to start with a little bit of music. We'll say, hopefully this is audible, but for just a little bit. Okay, um, Henry, I, I tried to play it, but it didn't work so okay. well. On, I, I on can this. do it. Okay, can, great. Uh, let me, whoops. Uh, here we go. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, what we've been listening to is uh, Joseph Haydn's Emperor Quartet, second movement, eight minutes in duration, uh, a theme of about two minutes, repeated four times, put to music, uh, and it was a poem written in 1841, the song of the German people. It was Germany's national anthem, Deutschland über alles in der Welt, since 1922. What am I trying to say by introducing my presentation with the German national anthem? Are we re-experiencing the world of 1933 when Hitler came to power, when the Third Reich came into existence? Or 1930 when there was still time to prevent that occurrence when the Nazi party was a minority or 1924 when the Nazis first came into the public view. Well, let's take a look and see what it is that the history tells us. First, my own story. My name is Henry Slucky. The name has uh, luck in the last name, which um, my wife reminds me of all the time. Named after a town in the Ukraine, Slutsk. I'm a husband, father, grandfather, a retired professor from the University of Southern California School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. I taught behavioral principles to uh, medical students and professional physicians and allied health professionals. I dedicate my presentation to the millions who perished during the Holocaust, victims of fascism, including my very own close relatives, here on my mother's side, my grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. On my father's side. And uh, many, many more relatives uh, of the next round, so to speak, of uh, closeness. And to our courageous rescuers who saved us from sure death. I always emphasize that if, there, if it were not for rescuers, there would have been no survivors. And to you, our witnesses to the past and builders of a better and more beautiful world. As survivors, we must tell our stories while we can. As witnesses, you must help to keep the memory alive and to prevent more holocausts from occurring. On that last point, we are doing a miserable job because every day somewhere in the world, there is killing, there is genocide, there is race hatred, there is all forms of discrimination taking place. We must actively defend democratic principles, be vigilant at all times, and protect everyone from tyrants, demagogues, and oppressors. As one of our commentators says daily, democracy is not a spectator sport. But there's another reason that we must tell our stories. There is a group throughout the world of people who deny that the Holocaust ever took place and that it is a great lie uh, as this slide shows at a dem counter demonstration that took place recently with the figure of a, of a person with a hat, a hat wear wearing a hat that has a, uh, a Star of David and bears a Pinocchio nose. Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. 
And it is significant that this particular photograph is of a group of people beneath the banner who are all in, have some form of disability. Let us remember that it was people with disabilities who were the first victims of the killing machine of the Third Reich, of the genocide of the Third Reich. Hitler referred to people with disabilities as useless eaters. Okay, as an academician, I always like to start with a definition, who is a Holocaust survivor? And this comes from the museum in Washington, DC, uh, the Holocaust Museum. Uh, it's Henry, I'm so, I'm so Jewish... sorry to interject. I realize your screen is not actually sharing. Oh, so I'm you sorry. mean you've seen none of the slides? Yes, I'm so sorry. I oh. just realized that. Um, if you, okay, so if, if you go to the Zoom window when you click on share oh screen. So let me end my slideshow here, okay. Um, there's a Zoom window and uh, do the sharing. Yeah, the, where it's green at the bottom and it right. says share screen. Yeah. Click on that yeah. and then you should see a small version of your PowerPoint. Right over here, right. And double click it. There it is. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. I'm sorry. So let about me that. go back here just yes. to this. Here is the. Let me start from the slideshow from this point. Okay. So here is the slide of a group of individuals whom Hitler referred to uh, historically as uh, useless eaters with the Martin Luther King quote about an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Okay, who is a Holocaust survivor? It's a person, Jewish or non-Jewish, who was displaced, persecuted, or discriminated against due to the racial, religious, ethnic, social, or political policies of the Nazis and their collaborators between 1933 and 1945. Those are the years of the Third Reich. So we'll look at that for a moment, but the definition goes on. It's a former inmate of a concentration or extermination camp, ghetto or prison, or a refugee or a person in hiding. That last phrase, a refugee or a person in hiding refers to me. I was not an inmate of a concentration camp or extermination camp, ghetto or prison, but I am a person who was in hiding uh, and uh, was a refugee. Some guiding principles uh, that we Holocaust survivors have agreed upon. There is no typical survivor. That is to say, each experience was individually unique. We also agree that there is no metric for measuring the degree of distress or suffering. And the impact on a survivor's subsequent lifestyle is going to vary from individual to individual. I was born in Paris, France on July 12th, 1934. And this is what Paris looked like uh, at the time of uh, uh, my childhood. People were dancing in the streets, the streets were decorated, and um, uh, I thought they were doing it for my birthday. But it of course was because of the 14th of July, the national day of, of, of uh, importance or independence of France, of the democracy of France. Uh, here are the banners of the French flag. Here I am, a picture of taken at seven months of age. It's winter, so I'm all bundled up. Um, my street, um, 
didn't exactly look like that when I was a kid, where the, the cobblestones were um, not as uniform and uh, the bushes didn't exist and uh, the newly painted and fixed up houses were not quite in such good condition. Uh, and here I am at two and a half years of age uh, when my uh, uh, tricycle, uh, which uh, you can purchase these Irish mailers, as they are called, uh, through the internet. They, they are still available, uh, where you guide the tricycle with your feet and you locomote by rowing the two L bars that I'm holding on to. This is the metro station uh, right around the corner, uh, Saint Ambroise, uh, that served as our shelter in 1939. This picture taken in 2013. I'll have more to say about that shortly. One of my favorite pre war images is that of the Paris buses. Uh, very typical, small, four windows on each side and a platform on which you entered and exited the bus. Uh, they don't exist anymore. They stopped uh, functioning in the, in the early or mid 50s. Some uh, pre-war rumbling in Europe. Hitler comes to power in 1933. This is a uh, photograph uh, which made the cover of Life magazine in summer of 1934. Um, of a rally in northwestern Germany in a big meadow between two hills. And as far as the eye can see, we've got banners and flags and uniformed people. Uh, the estimated size of the crowd, of this crowd was three quarters of a million, 750,000. Hitler was very popularly supported. He was not a lone nut. The symbols of the swastika, the colors, black and red. Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles, über alles in der Welt. Germany, Germany above all in the world. It's one thing to be patriotic and think highly of your country, it's another thing to say that you are above all in the world. It's um, Germany is great and the rest of you, never mind. Um, every soldier in the Third Reich wore this belt buckle and it had the uh, German eagle, the swastika, and in German, the words, God is with us. So if God is with us, we cannot possibly do anything wrong. In uh, 1936 in France, the United Front was founded. Uh, this is a, a unification of uh, political parties from center to left. They elected uh, a socialist uh, prime minister for the first time in the history of France, a socialist who is a Jew, Leon Blum by name. That same year in Spain, there was a Spanish, there was a civil war in which, um, which for many of us was the, um, the opening shot of the Second World War. Its significance was that uh, Franco, a general, and three others um, overthrew the democratically elected government of Spain with the assistance of Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini of Italy. Uh, they bombed for the first time uh, civilians, that is military hardware, military uh, weapons, were used against the civilians in um, bombing, uh, in this case, the town of Guernica in Northern Spain. And P Picasso, a Spanish artist, painted this 
which is now iconic as an anti-war poster hung in my office all these years that I was at the university and uh, is now uh, the original of course is in Madrid uh, shows and depicts uh, suffering uh, of uh, civilians by the military. Only the Soviet Union and Mexico supported the democratically elected government of Spain. And as a result, Franco broke off diplomatic relations with both countries. In 1938, the United Front is defeated in France. And uh, at that time, uh, shortly before that, that is, my aunt and uncle who lived in Paris emigrated from France to Mexico, uh, seeking uh, to uh, find uh, an escape from the potential dangers of the Third Reich. And they also secured Mexican entry visas for my parents and me. So from 1936 on, we could have gone to Mexico and avoided the Holocaust completely. But as most of us today in the United States, uh, we saw no reason uh, to feel threatened. Uh, we thought this too shall pass. I went on to school uh, here in Paris right next to what is now the Centre Pompidou. Uh, the brick building was my old school and where people are seated here in the foreground was our schoolyard where we played in the dirt. In 1939, my father volunteers for the French Foreign Legion, that is for the French army, uh, but as an as, as, as a, um, alien, as a non-citizen, uh, he could not become a member of the French army, but only as a volunteer in the French Foreign Legion. So we take a last minute uh, photograph. Uh, here I am at five years of age, roughly. And um, I was very sad that he was leaving us, but I was told that uh, it would be only for a short time. And uh, that optimism uh, has basically been uh, our the lifestyle of my family and me, uh, having learned that uh, we can overcome all these problems. Uh, here is a photograph of the uh, Regiment of Foreign Volunteers. Uh, some of them uh, made up of primarily of progressive Jewish immigrants uh, from Eastern Europe and Spanish Republicans, that is uh, loyalists, in exile who had fought and escaped to France, had fought Franco and escaped to Spain. This is my dad right here. And as you can see, the uh, no two uniforms are alike. Uh, the hats are different, the, uh, the boots are different, the jackets and so on. Um, they made do with whatever they could. Uh, in contrast, the, the um, uniformed Nazis marched into Paris on June 14, 1940. Um, my mother and I and my aunts and cousins, we were all on the sidewalk on that morning, uh, watching them uh, march through the streets uh, of Paris. Um, and they occupied Northern and Western France. Uh, and this is what it looked like. Uh, all the colored parts are occupied and the white here in the center and lower part of France uh, is Vichy, unoccupied France. And um, um, in uh, my father's demo demobilized on the 16th of June in Southern France. And uh, my mother and I escaped Paris by train and joined him in Montauban. Here's the old train that we took, we used to love those little compartments. And uh, we arrived in Montauban. The station today looks pretty much the way it did then. It's in Southwestern France here, not far from Toulouse and from the Spanish border. Uh, 
We arrived there on June 28th, 1940. A uh, town, a beautiful town with a river running through it, the Tarn River. And this building here is a museum in Montauban, named after the artist who was born and lived and died there, Angle. Uh, I've discovered a couple of years ago that uh, uh, on the internet, I, know, I read that uh, the uh, Mona Lisa uh, was uh, securely hidden in the basement of that museum um, to a safekeeping from the Germans who had occupied uh, France. Um, so uh, the Mona Lisa and I were neighbors for a couple of years. We lived uh, just off the river here, uh, below, just below the slide. Um, and um, uh, from uh, 1940 on, um, I used to walk right past this church around here and onto my school and a beautiful town, a Huguenot history of uh, resistance to tyranny of the Catholic Church. Um, and uh, our house uh, is uh, the, in the next slide, uh, on the, is a, with a white front door. Here it is. Uh, my room was upstairs here and my folks were here. Um, we lived there. Uh, very uh, happily uh, for the next uh, two years. Uh, we would not have known that there was a war going on uh, throughout Europe. Uh, we lived a normal family life until the morning of August 26, 1942. At six o'clock in the morning, the gendarme knock on our door to round us up uh, to deport all Jews from France. Uh, my folks come running into my room uh, very quietly and awaken me um, and uh, basically tell me to be very silent and we are going to pretend like nobody is home. So uh, we played the game of let's pretend nobody is home uh, for an hour and a half. Uh, they were knocking on the front door and we continued to stay in the room and be we were very quiet, so they didn't know that whether there was someone there or not. Their orders were to knock on the doors uh, and round up people who answered the door, but not to knock down the doors. So by 7.30, uh, they went back to their headquarters without us. Uh, for the next couple of weeks, we are hidden by our landlords, the Kaden family on their farm. Uh, they help us get all the legal documents and we go back to our normal life um, in our house. Uh, incidentally, the Kaden family um, was honored, as you'll see in a few moments, uh, by the uh, Yad Vashem Museum in uh, Israel uh, as righteous among uh, nations uh, because they saved uh, many Jews. On uh, November 11th, a couple of months later, uh, the German army occupies all of France. So now all of France is occupied. And here we are uh, in Montauban, which was a stronghold of uh, uh, refugees from Spain. My parents uh, politically in harmony with those who were in exile from Spain, uh, befriended them and in, uh, at this time in 1942, uh, we sell all of our possessions, uh, hire three uh, guides who had made their way from Spain to France uh, to take us the other way, to go from France to Spain, which we do on the night of November 25th, 1942, uh, across the Pyrenees and uh, we crossed the Pyrenees on foot in five nights uh, in order to avoid the French and Spanish border guards. Uh, the Germans were there, but they had just gotten there two weeks earlier. Uh, so um, they weren't uh, as effective. I suppose uh, had we escaped a week later or two weeks later, 
uh, we would not have, or attempted to escape, we would not have succeeded uh, to cross the mountains because uh, uh, the Germans were much more efficient in blocking uh, traffic. So in addition to being a Holocaust survivor, uh, I'm also an illegal alien. Uh, note that these words are not mine, they're in quotes. Um, I don't use terms like that. Uh, we escaped to Barcelona, Spain, our new home. It's a great city, the Ramblas. Here we are, a postcard from the 1920s, pretty much the way it, the Ramblas looked when we got there. And Plaza de Catalunya, the main square, again, looks pretty much the same on this photograph of 1920s as it did uh, when we were there. Uh, nowadays, there are many more modern buildings around. As you can see, it's pretty much like uh, the layout in Los Angeles with the uh, uh, ocean on one side and the hillsides on the other. Uh, it's a Mediterranean climate, obviously. Uh, great city, great people. I love to dance and sing but they had a fascist government. And here is a photograph of Hitler and Franco, partners in crime. In Barcelona, I, my folks enrolled me in a, a French school. Uh, again, this picture taken in 2013, and it looks pretty much the way it did when I was a student there. Um, in April of 1943, while we were there, uh, there was a Bermuda conference between the United States and uh, the United Kingdom regarding uh, pol immigrant policies or immigration policies, uh, especially focused on Jewish refugees who uh, we were trying to escape from uh, Europe, from the war. And, um, the uh, conclusion of that conference was um, uh, there'll be no change in the policies. Um, note the important uh, uh, event uh, surrounding the St. Louis, uh, the boat that returned to uh, Europe uh, with uh, uh, people, with refugees attempting to leave Europe. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt, my hero, steps in to oppose the United States government policy on immigration and uh, fights for implementation of a small program modeled on the Kindertransport of uh, Jewish children who went unaccompanied to England from Germany and Austria in the late 30s. And uh, the uh, American Joint Distribution Committee and the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society uh, actually administered the program. And so um, uh, there's a transport that was assembled um, of several children, Jewish children without their parents. Um, and um, my parents couldn't uh, see us separated, so they took me off the list at the last minute. And uh, the first convoy in May left without me. In July, there was a second convoy. And again, my name was on that list. And again, my name was removed at the last minute. And finally, in September, the third convoy is assembled. And this time, the announcement is that um, this is the last of the convoys. There will be no further groups going. So my parents leave my name on the list and I say a final goodbye to my parents at the main train station in Barcelona. And uh, we all cry. My parents are on the platform. Uh, I'm in the train compartment with the other nine children. Uh, ages three to 15. And we go from Barcelona to Madrid and from Madrid to Lisbon 
where we are going to take the ship to the United States. Here we arrive on September 22nd in Lisbon, and that's me right here in the center. Uh, and here we are, the 10 of us, uh, accompanied by or chaperoned by a couple who uh, were co-workers uh, at the uh, uh, Joint Distribution Committee. Uh, I'm in touch with a couple of these children here. Uh, this one passed away last year or two years ago. Uh, his brother, uh, who was six at the time, uh, lives in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, this one went back to France and lives very close to Geneva. Um, and uh, I'm very fortunate in, well, let's see, we take the ship, uh, the Portuguese ship, across the Atlantic. Here's the um, manifest. My name is the very last one on that page. There I am. Uh, and all of the details of the, uh, you know, what language we speak and where do we come from and so on. Uh, in 2001, um, I uh, Googled an, an uh, information, Naval Battle, North Atlantic, October 1943, because I remembered that there was an event that uh, we had to circum uh, navigate around this uh, uh, and to avoid uh, a naval battle that was taking place. And sure enough, this is what came up. And here it is in the North Atlantic on October 4th, uh, two U-boats were sunk. And here's the report of what happened to them. Who did it? We uh, ate pineapples in San Miguel uh, in the Azores. We saw flying fish. And this being the early fall, uh, we had some very big storms, fortunately no hurricanes. We arrive in Philadelphia on Wednesday, October 13th, 1943, dock at the foot of the only bridge that existed at the time across the Delaware River. And we docked right over here. And from late that afternoon, we go by train to Newark, New Jersey and by cab to the Hebrew Orphan Asylum and Shelter Home. Here's a photograph of it. It no longer exists, it was torn down, but I remember it well. Uh, the very next morning that from the, when we arrived, we uh, were ushered in to the large uh, dining hall, uh, tables of uh, 10 uh, chairs and, and laid out. And uh, in front were, of each chair was a bowl with spoon and then uh, a pitcher of milk. And uh, in the middle were cardboard boxes. We had no idea what this all was. We looked around to see what the other kids in the orphanage were doing. And they were all busy dumping uh, cereal out of the uh, boxes, which we had never seen. We had never had dry cereal. Um, so we became Americanized uh, very quickly. Uh, we were quarantined, we were given physical exams, lots of shots, and then put up for uh, foster care uh, through the foster care agency. Uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, I got to go to live with my great uncle, Nathan Gora, who uh, lived in Washington Heights in New York City. Uh, at that time, the George Washington Bridge had only one uh, level, uh, lots of greenery around, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I came to America as a nine-year-old speaking French and Spanish, but no English. My great uncle and great aunt spoke English and Yiddish, but no French and no Spanish. So it was total immersion and uh, in school was English. No one spoke French or Spanish. Kids on the block, English only. Neighborhood stores, English only. Neighborhood movies, English only. 
I did listen to the radio. Um, well, whatever was popular on the hit parade, I got to learn uh, and used it to learn my English. Um, funny how accentuate the positive uh, sounded like a foreign language to me. Mersey notes, try that one on for size and uh, see what you can make of it. Uh, very interesting song. Uh, I listened to the radio and discovered a Spanish station where they played Latin music. Uh, Besame Mucho was very popular as it had been just prior to this in Europe. At school, I was put in the second grade, even though I was nine, I was very short, so I fit in very well. And it was easy for me to learn English. Arithmetic was uh, easy. Uh, in Europe, we were much more advanced. Uh, but English was, of course, the big problem. Uh, we had the Dick and Jane books and uh, moved on with Spot to more complicated uh, stories and vocabulary. Uh, had a public uh, library card and I read the funnies regularly, went to the movies. And uh, by the end of two weeks, I was able to carry on a reasonable conversation in English. Um, I, uh, at home, uh, we spoke Yiddish, uh, so I learned it rather fast also. Went to a Yiddish school um, to learn the grammar and vocabulary and so on. Um, became Americanized, changed my name. Uh, that is the spelling of it. And uh, my aunt and uncle uh, had uh, just very few records. Uh, this collection here, uh, music by Earl Robinson, words by John Latouche, a uh, ballad for Americans, is a good uh, 10, 15 minute summary of American history, which I recommend uh, all of you to uh, listen to on uh, YouTube if, uh, if you have not, if you're not familiar with it. Um, what about my parents? All right, they were uh, stranded in um, Barcelona and in April of 44, they decided to uh, apply for Spanish exit visas to go to Mexico where they had uh, visas. Spanish government refused them. Why? Because they had broken off relations with Mexico. And so the Joint Distribution Committee and the Hayas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, helped them get Cuban transport, transit visas, which means that um, they were leaving Spain to go to Cuba. So that's okay with the US, with, with the Spanish government. And Cuba would let them in just briefly to get through and move on to Mexico. And of course they had the Mexican visas. So they leave Spain and they go to Cuba. They get to Cuba only to discover that the Mexican visas have expired. So they are now stranded in Havana, but that's okay. At least they're on this side of the uh, ocean and they're safe. In 45, they request to come to the US and I go down to Washington DC and testify before a committee. Uh, and I remember being grilled by a, a tribunal group of people, uh, probably government or, you know, legislators, um, very concerned as to whether my father was a deserter or whether he uh, got out of the army uh, appropriately. Uh, and uh, I said, well, he was demobilized. Well, as I said, I looked like a six-year-old and terms like demobilized uh, um, isn't typically a, a a six-year-old uh, vocabulary, and uh, uh, they didn't believe me, so they, requ they my par parents' request was denied. Uh, in 1946, a year after the war was over, uh, they appealed their the ruling, and again I appear before a committee, and once again uh, 
uh, I, they grill me. And this time uh, they grant permission for my parents to uh, uh, come to New York City. And we were reunited on April 20th, 1946. Uh, incidentally, April 20th was the date of Hitler's birthday. Of course, he had been dead since the spring of 1945. My parents and I uh, move into our new apartment in Brooklyn, New York, uh, where we live for the next three years, and uh, then uh, move to California in June of 49. So we're 49ers as well. Uh, my education, uh, I finished my high school education here in Los Angeles, went on to UCLA, uh, got my bachelor's, went to Columbia, got my master's degree, uh, then returned to UCLA for my PhD in 1960. Um, I, uh, in August of 1959, married Carol Ostroff, and here's a photo of uh, the four of us, that is uh, Carol and I, and my parents. And uh, we have two children, Michelle Deborah and Daniel Mark. Uh, we have two granddaughters, Jenna Brielle and Lauren Brooke. Uh, so in, this is a photo of my immediate family taken in 2008. Um, so here I am and Carol and Michelle, our daughter, uh, Jenna, her daughter, and Lauren, her daughter. So that, the, our two granddaughters, our uh, daughter-in-law, Stacy, and our son, Daniel. 2013, uh, we take a pilgrimage tour. That is, we take our kids and our grandkids to Europe, to all the places where I had lived. So here we are in front of our apartment in Paris. Uh, my wife joins us here. So uh, here I am, our two granddaughters, our daughter, Michelle, our son, Danny, and then our uh, daughter-in-law and uh, son-in-law. Here we are in front of our house in Southern France. And I'm saying to them, if that door had been opened in August of 1942, uh, none of us would have been here, would probably be here. Of course, Carol was born in, in uh, uh, Akron, Ohio, and uh, she would have been here. And, and Stacy was born here. So um, the two of them, but certainly not our kids. Pierrette and Louis Cardin were honored by Yad Vashem and the Holocaust Museum in 1991. And here are their names uh, here. My cousin, Charles Volbach, whom I always include in this presentation, was an officer. He was a lieutenant in the resistance army from 1940 to 1944 when he was captured, tortured, and killed on the 30th of July, uh, basically two weeks, uh, barely two weeks before the liberation of Southern France. The French government now admits its role as collaborator with the Nazi occupant during the Holocaust, and these plaques now uh, are in every school in Paris, certainly, and it basically uh, admits to that uh, fact. And uh, so my Holocaust life, Papa goes off to the army and he survives. The gendarmes come to deport us and we escape. The Nazis occupy France and we escape. And I'm separated from my parents and we are reunited. In conclusion, and with deep gratitude, I say that it's thanks to the rescuers who risk their own security and their lives by refusing to be perpetrators, collaborators, or just idle bystanders that I, a Holocaust survivor, 
am here to tell my story today. We've published, uh, 52 of us have published a short uh, summary of our stories in a book called How We Survived. And I conclude with Pastor Niemöller's remarks. First, they came for the communists and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't speak up. Then they came for the Catholics and I didn't speak up. Then they came for me and by that time, no one was left to speak up. At the Women's March in 2017, this Jewish couple carried a sign in America, they came for Muslims and I spoke up and will continue to speak up because I'm a Jew who remembers. Never again to anyone, anywhere. Whoops. Um, whoop. Oh, dear. Let's see if I can, ah, here we go. And this is Pete Seeger's quite early morning, which I consider uh, the hymn of today. Okay, thank you very much. Michael, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Mary, for, for sharing your story with us um, this afternoon. We have a couple of questions for you. The first one comes from Maury Kagan, who says that several years ago, you participated in the German-Jewish dialogue. Right. What were your impressions? Can you please explain that to the audience and explain what, how you felt about it? Yeah. Um, well, thank you for joining us, and thank you for bringing that up. Uh, and I think you deserve a great credit for having uh, organized and assembled uh, children of uh, survivors of the Holocaust and children of former Nazis uh, who um, uh, participated in this dialogue. Um, I was very impressed with what the group had to say because it was a um, uh, if you will, a, a uh, uh, restoration of humanity uh, to what 
looked originally like a hopeless situation, namely the Third Reich um, uh, continuing to exist, uh, if not uh, in fact uh, virtually. Uh, but um, uh, the one thing, of course, that we have to realize is that all of these people, uh, the, the, for example, the German uh, children of the Third Reich members um, had emigrated to the United States and, and of course, um, uh, were on a path which was very, very different from um, uh, what the Third Reich uh, uh, had been. Uh, so uh, what I'm saying is that it's, it was basically a, um, a, a biased group in, in, a, in a favorable direction, uh, but it was not um, the, uh, uh, the seeing of a wrong by people who had committed that wrong. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there are still uh, some remnants of people living in the world who are racist and who have uh, uh, an, an anti-Semitic uh, agenda uh, and for whom um, uh, the other or the stranger is one to uh, deny rights to. Uh, it's, uh, it'll be a wonderful day when all nations will be able to say to foreigners and strangers, uh, welcome. Uh, we are happy to have you here and to help you in whatever way we can. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we continue to have uh, victims, uh, whether they're from uh, other countries or within uh, our own countries, uh, that we, um, we are still uh, very much uh, um, bigoted against. Uh, uh, I hope that we learn to overcome such bigotry. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, how long in total were you separated from your parents? Two and a half years. Uh, they were critical years, but, uh, but I was in contact with them by mail. We used to write letters. Um, I still have, my parents saved uh, most of those letters, uh, so I still have many, um, and um, uh, so I knew they were safe, and they knew I was safe, and um, uh, there were people, for example, who had, from New York, had visited Havana and seen my parents, or brought my parents regards for me who had seen me. So um, there, was a, there was contact, but it was still uh, on a day-to-day -day life. I was now living with my great aunt and great uncle and not with my parents for two and a half years. Remember how long given the um the state of world war that it would take for the letters to reach each other you and your parents approximately how long uh not very long probably not more than i would say um a week or two at the most um uh i know for example <laughs> it's it's funny uh um when we went to leave barcelona uh, we children were given by adults, some of whom we knew, but most of them whom we didn't know, uh, who had written letters and put them in addressed envelopes um, to relatives in the United States. 
And my folks gave me a pack of them and they said, uh, uh, here, hide them uh, so that nobody takes them away from you. Uh, and um, uh, when you get to New York, give them to your uncle and have him uh, put stamps on them and mail them. Um, because these are letters from people who want to get in touch with relatives directly. And, um, and that's what I did. And then uh, sure enough, I put these letters, uh, maybe the, about eight or 10 of them in my laundry, my dirty clothes bag. And uh, the customs uh, officers never saw them in Philadelphia. So um, when I got to New York, I gave them to my uncle to mail and he did. And I wrote to my folks saying uh, exactly what I had done, that I had hidden them and uh, uh, nobody saw them. And I gave them to my uncle and they were mailed. So all the mail that you gave me uh, went where it was supposed to go. About two weeks later, when I come home from school, um, there are three men in suits, business suits, sitting in the living room. My aunt introduces me to them. This is Mr. Slooky that you were waiting for. And, um, and she said to me, they have some questions they have to ask you. And they asked me about those letters. Who were the people? To whom were they being sent? What was inside those envelopes and so on? And I just, you know, said what I knew. And at a certain point, uh, there's a knock on the door and one of the kids uh, on the block knocks on the door and says, uh, uh, can you come out and play now? <laughs> and I looked at these three men. And I said, well, can I go? They said, yeah, go ahead. They saw that they were not dealing with an espionage ring, but uh, just a very innocent um, set of uh, um, circumstances where I had simply transmitted uh, 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 genuine human letters and not um, military secrets or anything that would be of danger to the government. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, you showed this plaque for your cousin a few minutes ago. Yeah. Where is that located again? Oh, I'm, thank you for asking. I, uh, I didn't say that. It, uh, the plaque in French begins with the words, here used to live. And, uh, and that was posted on the front door on the, by the sidewalk of the apartment building where he lived with his family uh, before the war. So it, and, and so when you go to Paris now and other places uh, that were occupied, you will see signs that are still there uh, that say, here lived so-and-so who was killed by uh, the Third Reich uh, Nazis um, for uh, participating in the resistance or for doing such and such, in this case, for being an officer uh, in the French army. So. Thank you. Um, why and when did your parents move to Los Angeles? Why? Um, well, <laughs> It becomes very interesting. Uh, here they, they were born in Warsaw, uh, accustomed to cold climates and so on. And we lived in Paris where it would snow every winter. But then from 1940 on, we lived in the Mediterranean area in Southern France and in Barcelona. And then they lived in Cuba. So when they came to New York, they said, no, um, this is uh, uh, too cold and uh, dark and dirty. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the family after the war was uh, 
uh, after long after the war, uh, decided to move to California. And so uh, my parents and I uh, joined them and we all moved to Los Angeles as uh, large numbers of people were doing. Um, uh, it was virtually impossible to find a place uh, to live, an apartment to rent or a house to buy in say Southern California. So uh, it was basically climate and um, looking forward to uh, a, a better life um, and uh, uh, the land of, uh, of uh, sunshine and uh, warmth. Did you ever get to see the family who hid your family on the farm or did you see their pro their progeny afterwards? Yes, yes. Uh, well, I, I um, didn't know them very well, of course. I uh, uh, had basically met them a couple of times as a child, but my parents were in touch with them all the time. And um, as it turns out, uh, Mrs. Caden, uh, came, uh, they were in touch with my folks all the time, and uh, she came for a visit and stayed with them in uh, Santa Monica, where they lived, and, um, and in fact brought them a photocopy of the document from Yad Vashem, uh, which I have, uh, that gives their name and what it is that they were being honored for, namely saving uh, Jews from the Holocaust. And uh, yes, we were in touch with them. And we did go and visit uh, in 1993 and saw them and saw the man who lived next door to us, who on August 26th, 1942, was approached by the French gendarme uh, to, uh, for them to borrow his ladder to crawl into uh, our bedroom. Uh, and um, when the gendarme knocked on his door and said, uh, uh, we'd like to borrow your ladder to get into the house next door, um, he said, I'm sorry, I, I don't have a ladder. And as he told us in uh, 1993, he said, of course I had a ladder, but I wasn't gonna give it to them. Uh, I wasn't gonna cooperate with them. Um, so uh, a, a great deal of, of uh, and this is very uh, uh, reminiscent of a great deal of uh, the civilian population in occupied countries like France who, uh, maybe were not active as the Cadens had been in hiding us, but were passive uh, resistors by uh, uh, not cooperating with the Vichy government. Um, so um, uh, uh, not giving the latter is a good example of the kinds of things that uh, many people did. Um, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I'm not going to participate with you, uh, but not make it a, 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 a cry of resistance, but rather um, just, um, uh, I don't know what you're talking about, or I'm just not going to get involved. Just being a passive, uh, um, idle uh, a bystander, uh, in this case, uh, for the right reason. Thank you for sharing. Um, we have several people uh, who have been typing in. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And people, one of our audience members says, thank you for sharing. I will be sure to share with my children. And people have also said that this is a different take on the history of the Holocaust for them. And so we're all so grateful. Thank you. For what you have shared with us and for what you always share with our community is you're a regular speaker at our museum. Right. And, and also, Michael, I'm uh, 
actively writing my memoirs and, and for the drama effect, I, I begin chapter one with a knock on the door on the morning of August 26th, 1942, and then go back and tell about my parents' background and so on, and then move forward from that day. So hopefully one of these days I'll be finished with my memoirs and hopefully publish them. I look forward to reading them. Thank you so much. Um, I know you mentioned this throughout your presentation, but what would you like people to take away from learning your story this afternoon? Well, there, there are obvious, there's several um, um, lessons. Um, number one, as I said earlier, um, there are survivors thanks to the fact that there were rescuers. If no one had been active in rescuing Holocaust victims, we would not have Holocaust survivors. Uh, you don't do something like this on your own. You might hide out, you might be uh, someplace in the forest or someplace uh, underground, so to speak, uh, but you need someone to help you. You cannot do it on your own. And um, so it's always important to remember from the uh, bystander's point of view that if you are not participating, if you are not active, then you're part of the problem. Um, that we survived, as I say, only because someone did something actively. The other thing, which I think is a, a, an interesting um, uh, effect here is, you were mentioning, Michael, earlier that people after the Holocaust were reluctant to or uh, unable to tell their stories. And I know quite a few of those um, who were traumatized and, uh, and could not uh, relive the story. However, some of us were able to talk about it from day one but found that we didn't have listeners. We didn't have the audience. When we would speak to someone about it, very quickly, we would see their eyes looking elsewhere, like, uh, how do I get out of this? Um, partly because they didn't find it of any value or of interest, and partly because they did not want to put us through what they believe to be a traumatic experience of having to tell our story. Uh, and that, we understand that, and that, that's very human. But it's also true that many of us who were ready to and wanted to tell our stories, um, there was not the audience. And that changed radically with the Eichmann trial and with a, what seems like an unrelated uh, factor, and that is the television series Roots. Roots had a very strong impact on the view viewing audience about the Black experience about uh, African slaves, Africans being brought over as slaves and going through uh, their history of discrimination. And at that point, many Jews said, you know, I have a story too. And then comes Steven Spielberg's 
Schindler's List. And that really clinched it because at that point, it became not only acceptable, but very much uh, the mode to tell your life experiences, especially of such significance. Uh, so that uh, uh, when uh, Schindler's List uh, was uh, uh, viewed, uh, it resulted in a lot of people saying, um, you know, it's very important for these stories to be told. And in fact, what Steven Spielberg did to his credit was to establish the Shoah Foundation, which now exists as archives at the University of Southern California, where um, uh, survivors were invited to record a video document of their story. So my parents, both my mother, my father, and I each have about a two hour or so uh, videotape in the Shoah Foundation. And that is the case for uh, over 52,000 uh, such videos. And as I said earlier, no two stories are alike. So um, uh, these archives are available. You can go to the Shoah Foundation of Visual History uh, at USC and uh, uh, get access to uh, those, uh, those videotapes. And uh, they're fascinating. Uh, and, and just imagine how many hours you have of viewing all of these tapes. And they're, they just added some more recently uh, from uh, other parts of the world. So um, the documents are there. And now uh, um, people feel much more uh, open about the lessons of the Holocaust. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us this afternoon, and we hope to welcome everyone to the museum in person at some point in the near future, and um, hopefully we'll be able to hear survivor testimonies in person relatively soon. We'll see. But in the meantime, we're going to be doing these on Zoom for the foreseeable future. Um, and you can get more information on our website, on our social media. So thank you so much to our audience. And thank you, Henry. And Michael, am I correct that um, uh, the uh, uh, videotapes of the Shoah Foundation uh, are uh, available through the museum? Yes, our museum is one of the few institutions um, in the world, actually, that has access to the full collection. And if you go online to the Shoah Foundation database, you can view a small number of them on YouTube as well. The Shoah Foundation uploaded a few of them. Um, so you can watch a few there, but the full collection of 52,000 plus at our museum and um, as well, we also on our the museum's YouTube channel, we record all of our public talks like this one is being recorded now. We record them and you can watch these as well on our YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henry. Have a good day, everybody. And thank you for joining. <laughs>